Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to Postscript, a special New Books and Political Science series in which Lily Gorin and I encourage authors to bring their expertise to a pressing contemporary political issue. Today, we engage the latest chapter in American abortion politics as the United States Supreme Court has just allowed a Texas statute banning abortions after six weeks to go into effect. We've assembled a panel of experts in political science and law to interrogate the construction of the Texas law, the Supreme Court ruling, another important abortion case on the court's fall docket from Mississippi, and how these cases map onto the wider political landscape. Dr. Renee Ann Kramer is a professor of law, politics, and society at Drake University and the author of Birthing a Movement, Midwives, Law, and the Politics of Reproductive Care from Stanford University Press 2021. Rebecca Kreitzer is an associate professor of public policy and an adjunct associate professor of political science at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and the author of some of the most downloaded articles in political science on the policy environment in which abortion laws are passed. Her most recent work, co-authored with Beth Reingold, Tracy Osborne, and Michelle Swires, is Anti-Abortion Policymaking and Women's Representation in Political Research Quarterly. Dr. Andrew Lewis is an associate professor of political science at the University of Cincinnati and the author of The Rights Turn in Conservative Christian Politics, How Abortion Transformed the Culture Wars from Cambridge 2017. He writes at the intersection of politics, religion, and law with an expertise in evangelicals, conservative legal activism, and rights politics. Dr. Joshua Wilson is professor of political science at the University of Denver and the author of The Street Politics of Abortion, Speech, Violence, and America's Culture Wars, and The New States of Abortion Politics, both from Stanford University Press 2013 and 16, respectfully. His article, Striving to Roll Back or Protect Roe, State Legislation and the Trump Era Politics of Abortion, appeared in Publius last summer. Dr. Uh, Dr. Mary Ziegler is, a, is the Stearns Weaver Miller Professor at Florida State University College of Law. She's the author of Abortion and the Law in America, A Legal History, Roe v. Wade to the Present, Cambridge University Press 2020, and has a forthcoming book, Dollars for Life, The Anti-Abortion Movement and the Fall of the Republican Establishment, expected from Yale University Press in 2022. We're so happy to welcome all of you to Postscript and the New Books Network. Let's begin with why this particular law and the response from the Supreme Court has evoked such a reaction from scholars, journalists, and the public. The Texas statute bans abortions after a fetal heartbeat is detected, around six weeks after conception, and does not include any exemptions for rape or incest. SB 8 has an exemption for medical emergencies. This seemed to be an easy case because almost 50 years of Supreme Court precedent, beginning with Roe v. Wade, insists that the Constitution protects a woman's right to choose an abortion before viability of the fetus, the time when the fetus can survive outside the womb approximately 24 weeks. We'd expect to see the Texas law struck down by a federal court with the abortion provider suing a state official, such as the governor or the attorney general. But that's not what happened, because the Texas law expressly excludes any government official from enforcing the law. Instead, Texas deputizes any other person to enforce the law. They are encouraged to file a civil lawsuit against anyone who is aiding, abetting, or providing an abortion, and they are incentivized to do so. As of September 1st, Texas provides a $10,000 reward or bounty if a person sues and wins, and their lawyer's fees will also be covered. The woman seeking an abortion may not be sued, but her counselor, clergy member, Uber driver, spouse, abortion provider, doctor, nurse, or anyone else aiding and abetting may be sued. Abortion providers did sue, naming every judge and county court clerk, um, a federal trial judge agreed that they could sue and scheduled a hearing, but the appeals court halted the hearing and the abortion providers filed an emergency application asking the Supreme Court to block the law from going into effect. Currently, Texas abortion providers have stopped offering any abortions beyond six weeks, and that leaves women 
who live in the second most populous state without access to what the Supreme Court has said is their constitutional right to abortion access. Mary Ziegler, why did Texas create this particular enforcement mechanism? What incentives does it create? And and what did the Supreme Court rule? So the the business model for this uh, kind of grew out of efforts in the 90s to use civil litigation to shut down abortion providers. And the, the real idea actually came from a statute Louisiana passed that was very different. It was designed to um, kind of advance the narrative that abortion hurts uh, women and pregnant people as well as fetuses or unborn children. And there the state authorized people who had had abortions to sue abortion providers for medical malpractice if there was harm to either themselves or an unborn child, as the statute put it. And again, said, you know, no state official can enforce this law. So when there was a lawsuit brought, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, the same circuit that heard this Texas case recently said, the government has immunity from suit. And that all stems from a doctrine that limits the circumstances under which you can sue the state. And that in turn (laughs) stems from a much longer history about the state's hostility to the idea of a strong federal government in um, post-revolutionary America. The only exception to this is that you can sue state officials who enforce unconstitutional laws. In Louisiana, in the 90s, Louisiana said there are no such officials. Texas saw that as a potential roadmap. And initially, there was a a very small town in Texas that passed a a so-called sanctuary city law that prohibited any clinic from operating in that city. Now, most, most sanctuary cities don't have abortion clinics. This one was no exception. But because the law would have been unconstitutional, some small town in Texas is not, pro- is not allowed to prohibit abortion because of Roe v. Wade. The attorney uh, working with Mark Lee Dixon, the gentleman who's at the head of the sanctuary city movement, introduced this mechanism where instead of the city enforcing the law, any private citizen could enforce the law. And this seemed kind of like an ingenious idea to Texas lawmakers who had long wanted to ban abortion, but had not wanted the potential downsides of a lawsuit, like losing in court, getting embarrassed, and having to pay hefty attorney's fees to abortion providers. So that was the inspiration. And the U.S. Supreme Court uh, seems to have accepted this argument, at least at this stage in the litigation. It's worth saying that if, in fact, someone does get sued either for performing abortions or for aiding or abetting, um, it's quite likely that it'll be easier to to identify who's enforcing the law at that point. There'll be a specific judge adjudicating a case, enforcing a damage award, and so on. So, I mean, there's been a kind of pretty vibrant debate among legal scholars and legal historians since the court's decision about whether Roe is already gone. Um, I tend to fall into the not yet camp because the court, I think somewhat disingenuously, but not entirely, said they hadn't reached the merits of the constitutionality of the law. They had simply said at the moment that it didn't appear to be properly before a federal court because there was no one to sue. That's a far cry from actually openly overturning Roe and inviting the kind of backlash that might entail. At the same time, I think it's right to wonder if the court would let a similar law go into effect if the right that was being compromised was, for example, you know, the right to bear arms or the right to free exercise of religion. And so I think it's certainly not a positive sign for the mis- if you're a supporter of abortion rights when it comes to the Mississippi case uh, that you mentioned that's going to be heard in late November or December and that should be decided uh, by June of 2022. Um, Josh Wilson, uh, Mary has referred to these sort of earlier times when the court has uh, grappled with using private individuals to enforce the law. Can, can you say a little bit more about the legacy and history of using private individuals or private organizations? Like, you know, I'm thinking about the the white primary cases or the restrictive covenant cases as, as examples where the court was grappling with, was grappling with that. But uh, can you flesh that out a little bit more? Sure. Um, the, the basic idea here is something that, that Mary touched on um, before. It's kind of how states respond to there being a weak state, right? That in the U.S., 
we tend to have a, a rather weak weak state in terms of you know enforcement powers. And so one of the things that we can see that's that's a parallel but also you know substantially different are uh, the ways that civil rights and, and other things have been enforced in the past is that you know progressives wanted to have civil rights laws and there were uh, there was a, a push to have the federal government enforce these things. But because they ran into conservatives within their own, you know, within the Democratic Party and within the GOP that were really opposed to expanding the powers of the federal government, so expanding the powers of the state, that forced them into a position of uh, relying on private enforcement of these kinds of, of laws. And conservatives also went along with this because there was a belief that a lot of the groups that were um, – going to be helped by civil rights laws weren't going to have the capacity to bring private enforcement. They weren't going to have the capacity to bring lawsuits. Um, and so this seemed to be you know, a way to, to pass a law, but also to dull its potential right out of the gate. Um, to kind of the surprise of, of uh, liberals and conservatives, the litigation resources that um, people were able to tap into made private enforcement a, a robust mechanism. Um, and pretty soon you could see private enforcement spreading into a whole bunch of different policy areas. Um, so, so there's this longer legacy of what, when you can't do something through the formal state government, there tends to be a pivot towards looking for private enforcement as ways of, of circumventing what the state can do. Um, and of course, what we're looking at here, though, is is also substantially different in many ways than than what we've seen prior um, in terms of uh, the scope of who is being targeted with SB8 and also the openness of, of who can sue. Um, and then, of course, there's the, the substantive difference, right, of what kind of earlier laws uh, were trying to accomplish versus what SB8 is, is trying to accomplish here. Renee, can I ask you what you think about this privatization and 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 why we should be focused not just on the substance of the bill, but the way in which it's being enforced by Texas? Yeah, thank you. I I agree absolutely with what Mary and Josh have said. I also want to note that this is really a classic culmination of the trend in neoliberal governance since Roe towards the privatization of state responsabilization for reproduction and enforcement of other kinds of laws. So this, this move is married to the state's longstanding interest in regulating who reproduces when and how for interests of state building. So I think we have to tie this small government idea to the fact that this is a neoliberal push to have private individuals made responsible for enforcing what the state wants or desires in terms of how people who reproduce can act in the world. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Renee. Um, Lily, did you want to jump in on the privatization as well? I wanted to ask about SB8 and the role of bounty hunters, essentially, which is a novel part of this new law. And I had been having a Twitter discussion with some other political scientists about the fugitive slave law. And it seems that the fugitive slave law from before the Civil War is kind of a precursor or precedent or a, a kind of blueprint um, for the structure and enforcement of SB8. And I'm wondering if anybody can talk a little bit about how the fugitive slave law parameters are similar or different from um, what we're seeing in terms of the new SB8 law. Who wants to take that question? I mean, I think there, there are some similarities in the sense that if you're thinking about, you know, why why have a bounty program, right? And I mean, one answer is it's different because this is about the, the rare state that doesn't want a direct confrontation with Roe v. Wade. Because one question you may ask yourself is why we've, we've seen conservative governors say they're going to use this as a blueprint. But an interesting question is why they haven't already done so, because it's not as if there isn't a sort of dialogue between governors who are opposed to abortion and state lawmakers about what policies to pursue. And the answer is largely because they wanted, by they, I mean, other states wanted to directly confront Roe and wanted to pass laws that directly violate Roe. 
And Texas's law doesn't do that. But uh, so one one answer is they're different because bounty programs with slavery, I mean, program is a really messed up word, but bounty hunting with slavery was, I don't think, really designed to avoid Supreme Court enforcement. That wasn't really at the, the center of what was going on. At the same time, I think there's a pretty big parallel, which is that you have, as Josh was saying, a weak state that's unable to enforce, in this case of slavery, what it what's viewed as property right or a view of white supremacy, here the state's mandate on abortion, it just would be impossible for the state to do that without private assistance. Um, A criminal mandate is not going to be enforceable without a network of informants and bounty hunters, because how is someone going to know if someone orders abortion medication on the internet or drives to New Mexico? It's just completely unworkable. So in both cases, I think you have states relying on um, private citizens to enforce what would be an otherwise unenforceable law and using bounties as a way to overcome what would otherwise be the weakness of the state. The court produced an unsigned 5-4 decision paragraph, though we know it was Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Coney Barrett, based on who dissented. Uh, The majority opinion insisted that the court, as Mary said, was not deciding the constitutionality of the law and that they they didn't, and they didn't mention any SCOTUS precedents, as some of you have already done. So, what did the majority decide? Uh, what should we attend to in this very short paragraph? Are there are there words or concepts that uh, people should be should be really thinking about that might have slided by? I, Andrew, do you want to start us off on that, and then anyone else who wants to jump in on the majority, and then we'll turn to the dissents. Sure, I'd be glad to uh, also hear what other people have to say because I think it's a good bit of like reading tea leaves when you're when you're looking at this short majority opinion. And so we all may have some slightly different. I mean, in some sense they they didn't say much, right? And, and what they said was basically uh, we are we're not going to block, and we don't see a reason to block this at the moment. But that doesn't mean we we're not going to step in down the road or or whatever. And I think essentially what that means is that they are open to this sort of very novel and unusual way um, to have sort of citizen oversight of the six week ban to allow to stand and also very open to saying um, this is not uh, this is not uh, on its face constitutionally impermissible right and so that, and since that, that's essentially what they're saying without saying it right so the the implications seem to be that's where this majority is going and I think you read someone like Justice Roberts' dissent to say um, at the very least we should, we should pause now and fully vet this in order to understand that you see this divide among, I think, uh, the very small conservative faction, Justice Roberts, uh, and then, you know, the the five, um, the five in the majority in this case. So that's sort of where, I mean, I think it it gives really big signals, as as Mary was saying, to what might happen in Mississippi in the the future of these things, though they, they have, you know, left this sort of wiggle room on uh, different procedural grounds on how they are going to going to decide, but I'm very interested to hear what other people's um, tea leaf reading on the majority uh, is. And before people jump in, I'll just ask like a little bit about you know this word uncertainty because you know it seems to me that the 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 court has jumped in when there has been some uncertainty in the past. For example, the free exercise uh, cases, they've not only enjoined state action, but sometimes state action that no longer existed. So I I found that word, for me, uncertainty was a word that kind of popped out. But um, yes, please, what... um, I think you're right on that to say, like, when you compare across the way they are treating different types of constitutional rights, um, that you're seeing some stark differences. And so I think it's pointing that that word is really important for how we would compare on how they think about this. Um, to, to jump in here, one thing that really struck me about reading that was, you know, the fact that that Roberts is on the outside, um, you know, is, is not aligning with the other conservatives. And I, what I immediately jumped back to was um, Roberts writing in June Medical Services, because when I read his uh, writing in June Medical Services, I read that as him laying out uh, a more conservative, slower strategy at kind of reinvigorating uh, 
the chipping away at abortion rights. Uh, but what you see with the, or what I, what I took from the, the five conservative majority here was they don't want to wait as much anymore. They want to be more aggressive. Uh, and so I'm really curious about how the conservative justices might, you know, basically what Roberts, what those discussions are right now between Roberts and the rest of the conservatives on the court as to how to move ahead and how to think about preserving the court's legitimacy and public reputation while maybe also still trying to give states more space to to regulate and chip away at Roe. Mary? Yeah, I mean, I think Robert's role in all of this is really interesting because on occasion in recent decisions, and and, um, Andy would be particularly good on some of this, on particularly the free exercise of religion um, in a case involving uh, foster parenting and same-sex couples, Uh, Roberts was able to do what he sometimes has done in the past, which is essentially to pull off a majority he really shouldn't have, to to be the swing vote when he's not really the swing vote anymore. And so far in abortion, I think to Josh's point, that's not happening. If the court had been wanting to take Roberts' road, which seems to be to at least have some sort of manifestation of respect for precedent, maybe not actual respect for precedent, but at least discussion of respect for precedent. There was a roadmap available and there were lots of state laws in the pipeline that the court could have heard if it wanted to follow that playbook. The fact that it chose the Mississippi law that it did and the fact that it let the Texas law go into effect suggests that uh, what, what are probably the two swing justices in most of the abortion cases now, as far as we can tell, probably Brett Kavanaugh in particular, but also maybe Amy Coney Barrett, maybe Neil Gorsuch, although that hasn't really been the case very often, um, are not interested in the approach Roberts has developed. Now, whether that means they want to overturn Roe in 2022 is not clear, but it does mean that it's, this doesn't seem to be an instance where Roberts is is has control of what the court's doing or is really directing the strategy. Mary, you've written that, that Gorsuch's dissent in June medical says like not only that Roe is wrongly decided, but it's, it's warping other aspects of American law. Can, can, can you imagine him siding with, um, the liberals in any, like what could bring him to that place? Because he seems so disturbed, not just on the substance, but on, on its effect. It's almost the opposite of where Sotomayor sees, you know, the rule of law being uh, warped by this decision, which we'll get to in a minute. But is there really anything that could bring Gorsuch over? I I mean, I, I feel bad. I feel like I've learned so much from you about how different he is and I'm I'm wondering if you've changed your mind or you really you, what what you think is there. I mean, n- no, in is the sort of short version. Um, so, I think Mark Spindleman at Ohio State has written some interesting stuff on Gorsuch uh, to the effect that Gorsuch wrote, um, as many of our listeners know, an opinion uh, holding that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act includes protections for gender identity and sexual orientation discrimination. And in that opinion, said some stuff in dicta about the importance of self-determination that Mark thinks would make it harder for him not to see the importance of a right to choose abortion. The obvious counterpoint to that is that the little bit of evidence we have about what Gorsuch thinks about abortion, which is in June Medical, is, is not really, sorry, is not really going to help much. Um, So in particular, uh, Gorsuch, as you mentioned in his dissent, um, used the the language that the court had lost its way. Um, This was very much reminiscent of uh, pro-life or anti-abortion talking points. They they call it the the abortion distortion effect, right? The idea that Roe has deformed how courts approach legal rules on everything from who has the right to sue to the rules of wrongful death lawsuits. And Gorsuch seemed to be echoing that point, which certainly is not, you know, a sign that he's ready to step up and save abortion rights. So, I mean, personally, I'm more inclined to see Kavanaugh as the swing vote. Um, I very much felt that Kavanaugh was the the voice in the order that we saw out of Texas. There's a sort of 
almost apologetic tone that Kavanaugh strikes sometimes. He, he did, he's done that in several cases where he's sided with the court's conservative majority, but sort of said, oh, you know, this, this is a big deal and I'm not taking this lightly. And I mean, he, he doesn't seem to want to offend people, but he also seems to be willing to break with Chief Justice Roberts and not worry about the consequences, right? Even if he's sort of trying to manage the fallout. Um, but no, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> Mark, Mark's writing is really brilliant. And I think, you know, he does a good job trying to convince Justice Gorsuch that to be consistent, he should do these things. But I'm not convinced that Justice Gorsuch will do those. Things. Roberts, as people have already mentioned, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan all wrote separate dissents, displaying various degrees of passion, frustration, and, and court precedent. Uh the, the Breyer one, in to my mind, is sort of the least interesting and, and adds the least to, to what we would know. But I'm wondering what people think are the main takeaways in terms of these dissents. And we've already started this conversation, but did we learn anything new about Chief Justice Roberts' approach to the abortion jurisprudence from his own dissent here? So uh, we can start with any of them. Uh, so feel free. I apologize. I, I'll say I don't think that we necessarily learned anything new explicitly, but we, we re, I think we did reaffirm the distinctions between um, how Justice Roberts might approach uh, the issue of the constitutionality of abortion and restrictions on abortion rights and how uh, the, the other five colleagues would approach that. And I think especially this sort of I think there's long been a debate of whether or not something like Casey would be chipped away at or would be completely um gotten rid of. And Justice Roberts certainly, I think, is clear that he, he seems to be more on the chipping away side. Uh, and I, I think this that, that affirmed that, this uh, affirmed that sort of approach, while the others, by sort of, by not uh, not pushing back on this legislation text, they, they seem to have said, like, we're okay to take bigger steps, right? We'd be, we're open to, to much larger leaps in this direction. And so I think that's one of the biggest things that, that we've learned it, and I think what it does is open the doors to the activists, and we'll probably get to later, on what their strategies will be in, in other places. No, th- um, thanks, thanks for that, um, Andrew. And 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 I, I, and I think that Roberts. I mean, obviously, and this is this is Pat. It's what everybody says. I mean, he he's the chief justice. It's his court. It's named for him. He has a lot to lose if the court looks simply like it's putting its finger to the wind. He's quite invested in precedent and procedure and looking as if the court is, in fact, handling this, uh, not simply on the shadow docket, but but in a more you know, nuanced way. Uh, Renee, did you want to weigh in on on uh, on Roberts or the majority opinion? Uh, the, I'm sorry, the dissent. Sorry. Yes, please. Sorry. Um, I think where Andrew ended is exactly where we are going to see the most learning being done. I think what the dissents showed us very clearly is that for people who want to defend a right to reproductive autonomy or justice, this has to be a political and not a jurisprudential fix, at least at this time. I think those four were very clear that they they are not going to be in the majority when we look at cases like the one coming out of Mississippi, and we're likely to see Roe and Casey and their progeny not just chipped away at, but defeated. So that plus Biden, the Biden administration's response in terms of we're going to bring the whole of government to bear to safeguard abortion rights for people who reproduce in Texas. Uh, Merrick Garland saying the Department of Justice is going to intervene to make sure that the civil rights of, of folks are not harmed when they are brought up on these civil lawsuits. That points me to the fact that people who want to defend these rights are saying the courts are no longer the place, that SCOTUS is not the place where we are going to find remedy or they are going to find remedy. And this will become an even more, if you can believe it, politicized and political issue. Um, Mary and uh, Josh. Mary, why don't you go first and then and then Josh follow um, on on the the claims about where this will rest, whether this is about jurisprudence or this is is going to become a squarely political issue. I think the other battle that's being waged internally in the court is about transparency, um, because I think Kavanaugh is the swing vote. 
And I think Kavanaugh was going to great lengths to say what this was not about. He was saying this was not about what happens to Roe. This is not about the Constitution. This is about, I think, Kavanaugh, as much as Roberts wants political cover, right? He doesn't want to be the bad guy. He doesn't want overruling Roe to become his legacy. And so he's always been, I think, looking for a way to reverse Roe without political or kind of legacy defining consequences. And I see a lot of the dissents in different ways, Roberts and Sotomayor's dissents saying, you know, that isn't going to be possible. You know, this, that, uh, Essentially, Sotomayor's dissent saying people understand what this is and there already are going to be political consequences. And Roberts, I think, pleading that there can be institutional consequences. And as we get into the litigation of the Mississippi case, the strategy, I think, in some weird ways on both sides is going to be to say there is no way to avoid overruling Roe. Um, I know that the attorneys representing the Jackson Women's Health Center are going to argue that in their briefs, that a, sta- that a decision upholding Mississippi's law is a decision reversing Roe. Of course, that's not what Kavanaugh is going to want to necessarily do, right? I mean, there may be justices looking for a way to go much further than Roberts wants to go without going all the way there yet. And I think there was somewhat of a dynamic between the majority and the dissents of the, the dissents saying, you know, we know what this is and we're going to tell everyone. And so if you are going to do what you might want to do in this case or the Mississippi case, be prepared for people to hear about it, right? It's not going to happen literally in the, in the dark of night, which was what, you know, this was, it's also worth saying we haven't discussed this yet. This was a shadow docket ruling, right? It was released at midnight. It was not done with briefing. And so um, the court, we, it remains to be seen. I think Renee is right that the court is not going to be the place that people go for protection for reproductive rights or justice. By the same token, I don't know if the court is the place that's going to tell you that. Um, And so I think there's a conflict going on, probably with lots of different factions. There are certainly conservatives on the court who are happy to tell you what they are going to do. Um, Clarence Thomas has been doing that since the 90s, every chance he gets. So I think there's, there's a battle within the court about that too, about how clear to be about what's going on. Josh, did you want to say something on that? Yeah, I, I was just going to say that, you know, to, to kind of all the points that have been raised so far, um, Justice Sotomayor's dissent, just the opening three lines, like if you look at the language that she uses, like the opening line is, the court's order is stunning, right? And then it doesn't stop there. Like she says, you know, the, the law is, quote, flagrantly unconstitutional. She says the majority has, quote, buried their heads in the sand. And then she goes on to say, you know, they're flouting nearly 50 years of federal precedent, right? In those opening three lines, you're getting all the rhetorical ammunition you need to, you know, to to try to invigorate progressives and invigorate the the majority of Americans who don't want to see Roe overruled and to also kind of push some of these internal buttons of, you know, if you're flouting 50 years of, of precedent and you're burying your heads in the sand, that's also pointing at the court itself and saying, you know, Hey, we're threatening our own legitimacy here. So you're getting the deployment of so many rhetorical tools just in those opening three lines, and uh, and I just I for me that like that just really caught my attention of how how aggressively she's coming out right away, and in, it's also in no way surprising. No, and <clears throat> we often talk about like a respectful dissent. Well, this is a dissent, and mm-hmm. she's she's very strident about it, and complementarily, I think Kagan is really pushing on the scheme. She's saying this rewards the scheme in Texas. And, and and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, this is the first use of the term shadow docket in a SCOTUS opinion. And she is, as, as Josh and Mary and others have said, they are relying on a shadow docket opinion. She says this will lead to more unreasoned, inconsistent, and impossible to defend arguments. So she's been the justice committed to compromise and reason, but I think she's seeing that this is a you know, there's no oral arguments. It's a very thin brief, and nevertheless, this is is uh, is 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 what is is, ta- is holding the day and is moving forward 
to, in fact, create a limited of access in Texas to abortion. Uh, Lily, why don't you go on and then and we're going to transition over to Mississippi and to the wider politics after that. Go ahead, Lily. My question goes to the really complicated nature of SB8, um, this unsigned decision that came down at midnight uh, last Wednesday. It's controversial because of the role of the bounty hunters with the, th- the $10,000 to turn in people who help someone pursue an abortion. Um, there's a lot of confusion about whether this has outlawed abortion in Texas or made it essentially inaccessible and what is the role in terms of options in other states, either near to Texas or other states that have some restrictive measures around abortion. It is part of this kind of shadow docket that is also confusing to most Americans who aren't legal scholars. Is the point here to really confuse Americans with regard to access to abortion and whether or not um, the the new SB8 is, is a clear law or one that that, you know, is is possibly really muddled in terms of the various components of it. I mean, I think that was the point. I mean, I think that's been the idea with the shadow docket. Um, the shadow docket used to be for kind of really mundane stuff like, hey, we have to file our brief and we need another week. And during the Trump administration, it became where the court did a lot of its most controversial business, I think, as a way to diffuse controversy. So we've seen decisions about the border wall. We've seen decisions about stay-at-home orders and in-person worship, and now we've seen decision an order on abortion. I think it didn't it didn't work because Roe is unique. Um, there's lots of data, and Andy probably knows this better than I, that most Americans don't know or really care much about what the Supreme Court does most of the time, and have sort of residual positive feelings about the court, particularly folks who are more educated. But when it comes to Roe, people who don't care or know about the court know what it is and understand that Texas functionally doesn't allow abortion anymore. So I think the fact that this was done on the shadow docket has not really shielded the court from scrutiny in the way the court may have wished. Um, And so it's an interesting sort of experiment to see if you know, the, the shadow docket is as attractive when there is what appears to be a backlash or the amount of attention this is attracted. Yeah, the, the one thing that I would just throw in here, too, is something that's just kind of remarkable to me in a way is, uh, you know, to think that, that you could bury this in the in kind of current contemporary political context. And what I mean by that is, right, Democrats have paid far more attention to the U.S. Supreme Court in the last few years than possibly ever, barring Bush v. Gore, right? Um, the the attention that the Kavanaugh hearings got, right, and the the fact that there was a discussion during the presidential election of changing the composition of the Supreme Court, the fact that now people you know, who follow politics actually know what the Federalist Society is, right? So what I'm just bringing up here is that the, yes, historically, people don't pay attention to the court. And yes, still relatively, there's not a lot of uh, probably public understanding and following of the court and judicial politics. But given uh, where we're at now versus where we were at just a few years ago, there is a lot more attention being paid and so I think this all kind of ramps up uh, potentially that that discussion of court legitimacy and the need to protect the court legitimacy and the need to maybe protect for conservatives the current composition of the court. But that's a that's a whole nother uh, road to go down. So sorry. Um, one thing I wanted to add is that the vast majority of Americans already don't understand the state of what abortion law is. Most people think about Roe versus Wade as being the important Supreme case to know about, but they don't understand how cases like Ch- Casey have already been chipping away at at the accessibility of abortion in the first place. In political science, we often talk about how abortion is this quote, easy issue or a morality policy issue in which it's easy for people to form opinions about it. But the reality is, is that most people have 
really conflicted opinions about it and and aren't on the clash of absolutes on either side of the issue. So what we find is that when we have these laws that are really complicated, people are even less likely to understand what the state of abortion access is. So with these laws coming down, like Texas, even if the implementation later on is found to be unconstitutional, it'll have a silencing effect um, and a suppressing effect on people's um, access to abortion. With people right now fearing legal culpability, they will be less likely to, you know, maybe cross state lines or go further in order to find abortion. The other thing I'll add is that the public is confused just when they read the news about legal court cases. So leading up to this um, law going into effect months ago when the law was passed, all of a sudden a lot of people started calling abortion clinics trying to ask about if they could schedule. There was a lot of confusion about whether or not abortion was still legal or not. And so there's a major disconnect between what the situation is at the courts and then how the mass public understands access to abortion to be in a very real sense. I just want to follow up. And I think, I think Rebecca's points are really good for us to understand, like the, like how the public understands these issues and how those of us who track the Supreme court can be very different. But in this case, what I think, especially for those on the right, you know, I think they tried to hide this behind some sort of procedural ruling, but yet the, the main takeaway coming out of this was this, you know, very restrictive um, ban on abortions that they had in Texas with a unique scheme. And then I, I think, that what that that's what the takeaway is going to be, right? That what, what the court's done, and so uh, rather than perhaps something like uh, had they just had the Mississippi case and you uphold some portion of of Casey Roe legacy, but yet you 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 allow more restrictions, right? And so I'm, I'm I'm curious on what the political takeaways will be, and if, if those who are pushing, uh, you know pushing the movement on the right, like what, what are the, what are the implications going to be for the, for them? And so, um, others may have some thoughts on this, but I, as you were talking about, like p- people don't pay much attention to the court and if they may have some negative reactions and those often fade pretty quickly and what will happen in, in, in something like this, right? Especially when the court, I think in this case has struggled to control the message, the majority opinion is, is sort of struggling to control, control that message. And so I'm, I'm curious about what's going to happen there. This is Renee. I really want to amplify what Rebecca said about public misunderstandings of legal decisions around abortion and add that the general public also has absolute misunderstandings about pregnancy and reproduction in general. And in part, this is the legacy of not having science-based, non-heteronormative, consent ideational um, sex ed, right? So that people hear a fetal heartbeat bill and they think a literal heart rather than an electrical impulse coming from a developing fetus. People hear six weeks pregnant and they actually start to visualize the little baby bump when really that's six weeks after the first day of a missed period, assuming that a person who is menstruating is on a typical 25 to 28 day cycle. People assume, and we've heard this in the press, that you can't get pregnant if you don't enjoy the sexual encounter. So what's the point of having a rape or incest, um, a rape or incest exemption to this policy? Because rape and incest can't cause pregnancy. These fundamental public misunderstandings of pregnancy are feeding into fundamental public unwillingness to look at what this law actually does and laws like this, which is to make women and other people who are reproducing almost preternaturally aware of their reproductive cycle and able to act autonomously on that information that they may or may not actually have in a way that allows them to make reproductive decisions. I want to add on to that. This is such an important point. The vast majority of Americans don't have a good understanding about pregnancy. People don't understand how common miscarriage is. And people also have um, incorrect ideas about when most people find out that they're pregnant. Um, Even people who are going through IVF and taking frequent pregnancy tests often don't know that they're pregnant until they're about four and a half weeks in. So a six-week ban comes up really quickly after four and a half weeks. The other part of this that's important to point out is miscarriage is very common. About a quarter of all pregnancies end in miscarriage. We haven't talked in this conversation yet about the criminalization of miscarriage, but I think there's a lot of concern among activists and people in Texas that what happens if someone has a miscarriage and there's 
it's hard to prove what causes a miscarriage. And so could, could people, um, you know, be charged with abetting an abortion if people just have a regular pregnancy loss. Um, And so this lack of knowledge among the mass public about pregnancy issues in general is really concerning here. Yeah, I mean, I think my my inclination about how people are going to respond to this is just based on, you know, I've had to talk to like a million people about this, so it's not a representative sample size. But what I've seen is that the, the very thing the court might think would help make people less angry about this, which is that it's so confusing. And I would say this is not just a law that's confusing to the public. This is a law that's confusing to lawyers. Um, I remember when this law came out, I was on some calls with other folks who study this. And it's it's really hard to understand, especially if you don't know the historical precedents. And it's really, really weird. Like, it's not like any other law you've seen. So I think the initial impulse would be, you know, no one is going to get it. So no one is going to be mad about it. That doesn't seem to be right, because the very thing that seems to be the most upsetting to people is the kind of mechanism the law uses, right? The sort of bounty program. It's already, I think, in the media being defined as a bounty law. And so I think the sort of weird enforcement mechanism that's designed to shield the court from scrutiny and shield Texas lawmakers from lawsuits seems to be what's upsetting people and may actually get people over the hump of sort of not understanding and feeling disenfranchised by not understanding. Um, I think that's backfired, at least based on what I've seen so far. And obviously time will tell. I mean, we're still early on in terms of what what it's going to look like in terms of grassroots organizing on the pro-choice side. But so far, the bounty aspect of this, the procedural aspect of this has been a focal point of organizing. We hear a lot about the base of the Republican Party and the base of the Democratic Party and how the abortion debate is one that energizes particularly the the Republican base. And it's been in, in recent years, one that has also been activating the Democratic base. So in turning to the, pol- the politics that surround this particular decision by the Supreme Court, we have essentially a new court with three Trump appointed judges in three years, which is um, a big change. We have had these women's marches, some of the biggest marches in U.S. history in response to Trump's election and concern about women's rights and rights of a variety of minority groups. So my question is, how does this decision, the court's new makeup, um, the activists on both sides of this particular issue, how does this map onto our current political dynamics and the fluidity or perhaps lack thereof in terms of who is voting for each party? We have also seen a lot of attention paid to those suburban voters as a key demographic group for both the Democrats and the Republicans. Does this impact that particular group of suburban voters in Texas and and in lots of different states? Um, And how does the politics of SB8 map on to our current political um, atmosphere in the United States? I I can jump in uh, on part of it to start. Um, So there's two things that that come to mind, um, given what you just laid out. So one is this kind of the political response and how this will play out uh, publicly, right? And I would actually pay less attention to the two bases than I would the space in between. And this is definitely where um, Rebecca and, and others can kind of fill in here. But the way I've always understood the the public opinion data is that you have this, you know, partly rooted in this misunderstanding of, of what laws are and so forth. You've always had this big area in the middle of people who say they don't want to see abortion made illegal um, all the way, and and they might, but they might be okay with some limitations. But then, you know, depending on how you ask those questions. But essentially, there is a majority in the U.S. that doesn't want to see Roe overturned. They don't want to see abortion made illegal. The one big question for me is: Does a law like this and the political reaction to it? help mobilize that middle ground? Does this become a more salient issue for those voters? And and then backing up a little bit, one thing that we started to see during the Trump administration was that 
abortion was becoming an increasingly important topic for Democratic voters, and thus was becoming an increasingly important topic for Democratic legislative members. And so you started to see some more activity going on on the Democratic side. So now for me, my question is, I can, I can imagine that increasing, but now I wonder how much traction does that get with uh, kind of the middle ground voter. Um, so the, the other one, you, you brought up kind of court legitimacy again in, in that question. I know I keep coming back to this, but, but one thing that comes up for me here again is, you know, that question of the court's legitimacy is going to play out differently depending on what part of the public you're talking to, Right. The Christian right has a long established narrative that the court essentially lost its legitimacy when it decided Roe, right? That line came up much later, but it it became a a, a substantial part of of kind of Christian right um, rhetoric. And so you could see this, you know, I could imagine a Christian right response to this as, okay, the court is finally taking action that can reestablish some legitimacy. But again, you switch to the other side, to the progressives, and then potentially to the, the middle ground. I think there's a lot of argument here for for this working against the legitimacy of the court, but I'll stop there. This is Rebecca. I want to jump in a little bit about what public opinion looks like on the issue of abortion. I remember in grad school learning um, that abortion was considered an easy issue and that it was easy for people to form opinions about it. And so people could easily advocate for their you know, their preferences to um, state legislatures and Congress. But the reality is, is that that is not the case and that abortion public opinion varies dramatically based on the question wording, even more than some other policy issues. So just generally speaking, what we know about abortion public opinion is that support for legal abortion um, for most people is in the middle. They don't think that abortion should be completely outlawed. They don't think abortion should be legal up to the ninth month of gestation. A good source of data on on support for legal abortion comes from the general social survey, which asks um, support for legal abortion based on um, different conditions. So is it because of rape or incest? Is it because um, a person just doesn't want to have any more kids? What we find is that support for legal abortion varies really dramatically across that. But we know that there's um, more support for um, abortion at younger, you know, earlier gestational stages. So for example, people are much more likely to support a ban after viability, which is around 22 to 24 weeks, actually is legally defined differently in different states. Uh, and there's a lot l- there's a lot more, su- or sorry, there's a lot less support for a six week gestational ban. Even among Republicans, um, most Republicans don't support a ban that doesn't have an exception for rape or incest. And so this current Texas ban does not have an exception for that. That's something that people feel pretty strongly about. We also know that public opinion on polls such as like pro-life or pro-choice it doesn't really track on to people's support for different abortion restrictions. So to Josh's point about we should care less about the extremes and more about the people in the middle, I think that's right. People who are very strongly um, anti-abortion rights or pro-abortion rights will be largely unswayed by this. But there's a lot of people in the middle who in the past haven't considered abortion to be such a critical issue, who are now seeing it in a new light and are now more attuned to all of these restrictions. Um, and they find that they're uncomfortable with them and they're not supportive of them. This is Andrew. Uh, that, I think that's a really good overview of where some of the, some of the data sets uh is and like what are the, I think, the difficulties in making some interpretations. I will just add, like, I th- part of what people being in the middle has led the activists, I think, to play a really big role. And especially at, uh, in, in state legislatures where they're, where, as our politics become more nationalized, I think some of the state legislative action is, is more hidden. And so that is, uh, that's become a big part of that. I, the other thing I would say is I think on the right, it's been so much easier, so much easier to pay, play defense, right? Like pushing back against um, the Roe legacy. And now what's it going to look like if, if those roles are perhaps turned right and switch and shifting so i think that's something to think about the right i think has been much more interested in the court over you know in over the last three decades um salience is a, is a bit higher though i think not i think we probably overstate sometimes how interested people are in in legal kinds of things but um we will see if there's some you know there's some signs as josh mentioned to some shifting momentum 
on uh, emphasis on the on the court. So that's something something to think about. The last thing I will say is uh, in the last election, I think one of the keys was sort of suburban weakness among Republicans. And so what does something like that do with the with the suburban weaknesses, um, especially you know, in white suburban weaknesses for the for uh, the Trump campaign? Right. What, what does something like this do for that? And um, I, I think that will be an interesting question when you think about national politics. But again, I think going forward, really are talking about state politics. Like the, the, um, we're, a lot of the action here is at the state and local level. And this is where activists and activist networks can have a really big influence. Yeah, I mean, I think it's hard to predict um, for all of the reasons everyone ha- has already outlined. I mean, I think one intuition I have is that there's a real danger on the right of complacency. Big wins in the Supreme Court don't tend to do social movements any favors. There's a long history there. I mean, most visible, I think, ironically, in the history of abortion itself. When you see, you know, what were then be abortion rights supporters saying essentially, you know, we won, it's over. Why are we even debating these people anymore? Or, you know, in this case, we're going to probably see uh, pro-life or anti-abortion folks. They're already doing this, but doing it more aggressively saying, you know, we won a nationwide abortion ban through the Supreme Court. So I think there's a danger of complacency or overconfidence. I mean, the wild, one of the wild cards for me is just to what extent this is a voting issue for people who don't like what's happening. Um, because we, we have pretty good data, not perfect data, because some of the questions in polling are not beautifully framed. I mean, asking people if they think Roe should be overturned presupposes that people know what Roe is. Um, and that's particularly problematic when people use Roe to mean a lot of different things. Anything from, you know, abortion until birth, which is what an anti-abortion person would think, to rights for women and reproductive justice. None of these things are really what the Roe opinion says. But I think it's probably pretty clear that most people don't like six-week abortion bans and certainly don't like full-on criminalization, much less punishment of women and pregnant people. The question is more just at a time when we have COVID, economic recovery, and a million other things going on, to what extent is this going to be an issue? And Andy makes a good point, which is that this may reinforce an existing narrative. Um, it, it does reinforce an existing narrative, I think, insofar as GOP strategy goes, in the sense that this is a sort of double down on mobilizing the base strategy. Um, it's pretty clear that Ron DeSantis does not have a majority in Florida that supports a ban on abortion at six weeks. That's just not, it's not there. But Ron DeSantis isn't worried about that. He's worried about winning the GOP primary and firing up the people who have to vote in that, which is very much the the Donald Trump strategy. So in that way, there, that way there probably are overlaps in the sense that people, you know, that strategy of potentially offending white suburbanites in order to energize your base can be costly, was costly. Um, and those things may reinforce one another in terms of whether we're thinking about COVID and mask policies in schools or abortion policy. They may be part of a similar narrative about what the GOP means when it comes to American politics. But it's always difficult to predict ahead of time to what extent a major abortion issue will become a major election issue. Although I'm inclined to think it will, because the closest parallel we have is really 92, which was when everyone assumed uh, the court would overturn Roe. And and Bill Clinton, there's lots of post-election analysis suggesting that abortion was a major issue in 1992 in ways that may not have been the case since. I'm just going to say to follow up on Mary that, I mean, when we have the California recall election and we see some of what you're mentioning playing out there in terms of looking for those those suburban voters and not alienating them. Uh, Yeah, Renee, please... uh, uh, please jump in. I know you had a point. No, I think it's really important to to notice that the public opinion data shows that moderates and most Americans do have complex thoughts about abortion. I don't think, however, that progressives should rely on the fact that moderate Republicans, moderate conservatives, and other progressives are upset about the Texas law to actually impact the way that the Texas law and others like it will unfold in the lives of people who need access to health care. And I think that's true for a lot of reasons, but I want to highlight two of them. One is that the polling data 
further highlights the fact that most Americans don't understand the reasons why people choose abortion, right? So most people who get abortions are already mothers and go on to be mothers. These aren't people who simply want to avoid motherhood. Most Americans who are in favor of a ban on abortion at the eighth month or ninth month, but not at the six week mark, also then don't understand that the reason for abortion at eight and nine months is for the health and life and well being of the mother and the child in what is almost overwhelmingly always a wanted or planned for pregnancy. So that the very people who say, I don't want a frivolous decision to abort are also the very people who are willing to say, ah, but at eight months, we just can't do that because it's a life. Those are folks who aren't understanding the motivations for people choosing reproductive health care in this way or the biology behind it. So it, it's a little bit worrisome to think that we would want to rest reproductive, that anyone would want to rest reproductive rights on these misapprehensions about why people choose particular forms of reproductive health care. The second thing, and perhaps the more um, politically worrisome thing, I think, for progressives is that 22 state legislatures are teed up and ready to go. 22 states, I live in one of them, Iowa, are ready to go the minute they perceive that there is an opening for them to restrict access further. These are rural states. These are poor states. These are states where people have limited access to health care in general and certainly have limited access to reproductive health care. So the moderates nationwide and the progressives nationwide who understand that abortion is a right that has been granted by Roe or, or the rights to privacy in a decision with your doctor have been granted by Roe pre-viability, that's all well and good. But if you live in one of those 22 states, it does not matter. You will lose access to health care. And maybe by framing it as a health care issue at some point for rural America, um, progressives might have a shot at reframing and changing the conversation that will bring moderates in. Thanks, Renee. No, that's really important to get us to the politics of abortion policy making and you know how not only are these states queued up, but in some of these states, this may be very good politics. Re Rebecca, do you want to talk a little bit to that? That's really sort of in your wheelhouse. I think it's so important to talk about what's happening at the state level. Much of our conversation has been about what's happening in the Supreme Court. But the reality is the laws are being passed and implemented at the states. Um, and there's a lot of strategy and um, collaboration that's happening across the states in the process of this. So the first thing that I think it's important to say is what's happening in Texas and in other places is a harbinger of what's to come, that there are going to be more states that are passing similar laws to this, in part because it's good politics. In the last several decades, we've seen an increase in polarization in Congress and in state legislatures. And with polarization comes incentives to take more extreme issues on positions in order to raise money. And it's well known that there are um, a lot of monetary donations and activists willing to support candidates who take extreme positions restricting abortion. It's also important to note that in the last decade or so, we've seen a significant increase in the role of women in passing these types of laws. In the past, Republican women tended to be moderate and tried to not say too much about abortion because they were in conflict with the Republican Party. But today, moderate Republican women are not getting elected. And so today we see conservative Republican women, and they're actually the ones who are introducing and advocating for these policies, often asked by the parties to be the front face of abortion policy to counteract this narrative of Republicans being anti-women. We see women not just in legislatures, but the model legislation upon which this Texas bill was based is from Faith to Action, which is um, one of several anti-abortion rights interest groups that creates model legislation, which is basically fill in the blank legislation for state legislators to pass that's been already vetted by lawyers. What we know is that when courts um, kind of give a pass to a policy, and I think Texas, it's we're not sure what's going to happen, but when the when the federal courts say that a certain law passes constitutional muster, we see a number of states then very quickly turn to adopt those policies. So as we see 
the Supreme Court kind of giving a pass to Texas, what we'll see is that more states will adopt this model legislation using the identical language um, as Texas in order to get around these Supreme Court um, in or, in order to kind of bypass the enforcement issue, um, as we talked about at the beginning of the podcast. So I think it's worth mentioning that the politics, it's good politics to talk about abortion, especially if you are trying to run in a conservative district. And that is um, especially important for Republican women because there's a stereotype that women are more liberal, Republican women, if they want to win elections in today's Republican Party, they have to show that they're conservative on these court issues, including on women's rights issues like abortion. Thanks, Rebecca. And obviously, we have, um, you know, we were motivated by the court's decision, but we've barely scratched the surface on abortion politics in the United States. uh, And we could keep going. But in, instead, I'm going to close this conversation by uh, by asking people to tell listeners what they should be looking for. It could be on what we've already talked about or what we haven't talked about. But but as they're going forward, listening to this, what should they be watching for in the next months? What are the words, the language, the things that should trigger them, the lessons that we have from the legal and political science scholarship? And um, well, I, I didn't really prepare people for this, but I'm going to choose Mary first because she's to the left on my screen and then go around to um, Andy, Rebecca, Renee, and Josh. I think um, it will be interesting to see uh, whether how much of a backlash there is to this Texas law. Um, I think it will be interesting. I think people should keep an eye on whether the law is enforced, which will be a good way to test the temperature of how much it's mobilizing abortion opponents. And then I think that the transparency issue that the dissenters raised in the Texas case is worth keeping an eye on as we move toward um, what's going to happen with Mississippi's law. Because we we barely talked about that, but of course that's going to have a potentially explosive effect on the politics of abortion, on social movement organizing around abortion, certainly on what the Supreme Court has to say about abortion and even on the party politics of abortion. So I think as we approach November, December for the oral argument, it'll be worth watching how all of the players in this um, are reacting to what the Supreme Court is doing and how the Supreme Court is responding to that. In uh, this is Andrew again. In political science, we kind of sometimes we try to think about how or groups or individuals kind of can expand the scope of the of the conflict at play. And I'd be I'd be very curious to see how um, how activists and national political candidates try to expand this conflict into other domains and, and the way that it gets linked to um, agendas, politics, mobilization. Um, because these are state level issues with, I think, really national interests and national and national politics, I think, really rules a lot of our American politics in in not as much in function and process, but in how we how we understand and how we um, integrate politics into um, into our world. And so I'd be very curious to see how different groups are trying to sort of expand and link this conflict into other things. Rebecca. Building off of what Andrew was saying, this is a really interesting time um, to look at conflict expansion. We know that right now the mass public is becoming more engaged on this issue as they're learning about it. And certainly public attention to it is high right now. But there's a real question about how long public attention on this issue can be sustained um, over the long period of time that it'll take for this court case to eventually be heard by the Supreme Court, and for the many months and years ahead of where we'll continue to see this type of policy proliferate. One thing that I think is important to watch is the role of private companies when it comes to this law. I'm from North Carolina, and here a couple of years ago, we had the infamous HB2 bill, which restricted transgender people's access to bathrooms, but also did things with minimum wage and um, among other things. What we saw in North Carolina was that as large sporting events and businesses 
and and states refused to do service with North Carolina, the politics of it changed. And indeed, we saw a partial reversal of HB2 in North Carolina. A few weeks ago when Texas, actually not a few weeks ago, very recently when Texas passed um, their voting rights bill, which restricts access to the vote for many people in Texas, we saw a huge outcry among uh, public corporations and businesses who said that they would be boycotting the state of Texas. We've only seen a few companies do that so far with the issue of abortion. So namely companies like Uber and Lyft, who potentially could be culpable if they're abetting people um, as they travel to abortion clinics. It'll be interesting to see if more companies join in or if they'll find that the politics is too controversial and not worth um, wading into these um, hot issue waters. Thank you so much, um, Rebecca and Renee. I believe you are up next. Yes, thank you. I agree there is a lot to watch, both in terms of law and politics. What I am going to be watching most closely and what I hope people will attend to are the indicators of maternal health in Texas. We know that states that restrict access to reproductive autonomy have lagging indicators of maternal and perinatal health. It absolutely is not good, usually, for the health of women, people who reproduce, and children to have laws that restrict their access to health care. So when we're using a pro-life rhetoric with policies that tend to actually create harm for women who want to have children and reproduce, I think that's an important thing for us to notice. And I'm curious to see if the maternal health indicators in Texas fall as greatly as they did during the time that whole women's health was being litigated. Joshua, you are next. So uh, I think one, I think Renee's point uh, is is a great one to to. Um, uh, that I just actually want to respond to really quickly uh, for two reasons. One is because the anti-abortion movement has pivoted to a language of protecting women uh, as being the motivation of their movement. Uh, so that, you know, these health indicators um, stand to be problematic for that rhetoric. And also because we can see those health concerns as being at the beginning of modern abortion politics, as being a lot of what drove the push to liberalize abortion laws in the first place in, in the mid 20th century. So I think those health indicator uh, uh, points are going to be increasingly uh, important uh, uh, in, in multiple ways. The, the other things that jumped out to me, one, I'm really uh, going to be looking out for a first use of SB8, um, how that's covered uh, in the media, how conservatives will move to defend um, the mechanism when they actually have to defend the mechanism. Um, and also to see if, if, and when there is a first use, because there's given the Supreme court's ruling, there's a natural tension within the anti anti abortion movement. There can be no case until SBA is used. So that's a disincentive of using SBA and just letting it stand as a threat that immobilizes Texas abortion providers uh, for as long as possible. So that's another uh, issue I'm looking at. The last one that I'm um, particularly interested in is what this does for uh, a progressive response for democratic states, how they respond to this, um, what they might do in terms of legislation, and then what uh, private organizations might do uh, in response to um, SB8 as well. And Rebecca, you get the last word. <laughs> I want to second everything that Renee is talking about, about the importance of looking at maternal health. We already know that Texas is in the face of an extreme maternal mortality crisis where Black women in particular are three to four times more likely to die than white women. As we're looking at these indicators, it'll be important to look not just at Texas, but the neighboring states as well. There's already indication that people are traveling to Oklahoma and other neighboring states in order to obtain abortions. And so we'll really have to look kind of holistically at how maternal and child health is changing over the next few years. Thank you all for um, talking with myself and with Susan today. I'd like to thank Renee Kramer, Rebecca Kritzer, 
uh, Mary Zig- Ziegler, Andrew Lewis, and Joshua Wilson for taking the time today. Um, we have so many more sort of components of this issue to talk about, um, but I think we're going to wrap it up at this. And thank you all for joining the New Books in Political Science Postscript to talk about abortion politics in the United States. I really appreciate it. And Susan does as well. Thanks for the invite. Thank you.